Thank you for joining us for another exciting episode of No Driving Gloves, where John, Will, and Derek take you on an exciting ride using over 75 years of automotive industry knowledge to discuss the collector car hobby. Well, there it is. We promised you a few episodes ago that we would find the audio of the first Mercedes-Benz car running, and I have went through my pile of computers and uh, audio cards and video cards and managed to salvage that, recorded off a 33 LP that was produced in 1958 recorded to MP3 or ripped to MP3 back in the days of Napster at 128 kps, and now converted to a WAV file here in 2017 for your enjoyment. And in order to see video of that car, be checking our Facebook and Instagram pages a Monday or Tuesday. You'll be able to see that vehicle in operation. We do apologize a little bit for the audio quality in the previous episodes. There was about six different mistakes made, some beyond our control. Where is the collector car hobby going? I guess he wanted to get into this hobby right now. What's hot? What are the what are the vehicles that maybe you should be buying today? What are the vehicles that maybe you should be selling? What categories do we think are hot? I've noticed that like say the collectible Ferraris and Maseratis, the, the road cars and that, why they've appreciated a little bit. No drastic changes in those markets in the hundred thousand dollar range and in the twenty million dollar range. Those cars seem to be I guess, reasonably stable for the market. And we're going to sit down and we're going to decide or discuss where we each think the various markets are, the hot cars, the things to be paying attention for. Uh, if you already have your one dream car, you know, if you're, if you've bought your muscle car or you've bought your car, first car from high school and you're ready to move on to something else that might stand some chance of appreciation, no, no guarantees. Fortunately, my little crystal ball is broken, and I could start dart this off like I usually do, but I'll go ahead and let one of the other guys go ahead and voice their opinions first. I guess I'll jump in and start just because, obviously, I'm probably going to talk about the early car market, <laughs> and then we'll probably work our way up through the years and talk about things like hot rods with Will and um, all those types of you know different cars and collecting realms that are out there. You know, I, the thing that I'm seeing currently in the early car market, you know, horseless carriage, brass era is still strong, has been for a long time. You know, I mean, typically when you're getting into brass era cars, horseless, horseless carriage era cars, you know, you're seeing typically around the six digit range, you know, 100,000, somewhere around there and up. What I'm currently seeing, and, and John and Will, if you have an opinion on this, jump in, but a lot of the people that are collecting brass era, horseless carriage, even the classic era cars, you know, the 20s, early 30s, they're all pretty much the older car guys that are basically dying off out of the hobby. And I think that's where we're going to start to see a plummet in some of the collecting prices because I unfortunately I don't think there's as many young guys like myself that are into those kind of era of cars. You know, for me, and maybe it's wishful thinking on my part, but I'm starting to feel like we're gonna see a little bit of a dip in that market in in the early car range. You know, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing in the early earliest car collecting hobby. Do you do you think that um well, in the in the South, you you just don't see those type of cars. So I wonder if maybe there's a, I don't know, maybe you see more up north than you do, you know, in the South, where where more of them are manufactured. Could that maybe play a little bit of a role in that as well? Yeah, I mean that actually an interesting point to bring up and discuss is that obviously a majority of your earliest cars were manufactured in the North. Uh, that's where auto industry kicked off, really. You know, I haven't spent a lot of time in the South with collectors in the South. 
I've been, you know, obviously a northern raised person, Michigan, lived in Ohio, spent a lot of time in those areas where the early auto industry really was. It is true. I know a lot more collectors in the northern states than in the southern states of those early cars. You know, that could play a factor. The fact that, you know, the majority of them are in one region of the country, it's affecting prices elsewhere, you know, in the south in the, versus the north. Um, obviously, when you get a market area flooded with one thing, you can start to affect the the price range. Yeah. Now, see, I look at what you've said just a little bit different in watching just the market overall. When you're getting, I'm going to say pre-1925, so pre-Model T's, the, the earliest of the early cars, I do believe that some of their interest is dying off. If you own one of those cars, it's for the novelty of owning those cars today. I don't think the disposable cash is there, but go back 2005, 2003, I think we were looking at ten, twelve thousand dollar Model Ts. In 2008, 2010, when the economy was in a little bit of trouble, they fell to the seven, eight thousand dollar range because. Now it seems that those T's are pushing fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars for a good car, at least asking prices. I I haven't been buying, so I don't know what the actual cash prices are. Uh, I was recently involved in a transaction on a early Chevrolet. What we bought it for, we thought was a steal, and it was still in the low teens. So if you want to research it, the numbers are out there; they're all public. I think when you get into that stuff, because you can't really use them, but when you get into the Model A's start getting into the 30s, even with those cars, the general populace cars, the, you know, the first Plymouth in 28, the early Chevrolets, as we discussed, when they started to make those transitions from those rudimentary machines and went more production, more mainstream, America got on the wheels, I still think those cars are a little bit desirable. They're not the first car you go out and buy. But they're, the, you know, you go out and you buy what was popular in your youth, and then you buy your dad's favorite car. And when you get two or three or four cars deep in your collection, you might start getting one of those because nobody else has one. Part of this hobby is sometimes being different than the guy next door. I agree with you that the customer base is dying off. The customer base, unfortunately, will not replace it. You know, we're not losing one, gaining one. We're probably losing losing three, gaining one, losing four, gaining one. So there will be some correction. As these cars get older, too, they start are disappearing and getting lost or being reused or end up changing the categories that they're in. And what I'm thinking is... All of a sudden, they get modified into a street rod, get slightly updated to become more usable. It's really popular to, I think, use, is it a Ford four-speed transmission and updating the rear end? And then all of a sudden, your Model A can keep up with, you know, highway speeds. It makes it a car that you could kind of drive every day. Personally, it's not a market that I would jump into if I wanted to make a bunch of money overnight. But I think it's a market you could jump into and have a car not lose everything on. It might be depreciating, but it's going to depreciate at a slow rate. Ten years, that might be different, but I think right now that market is what I would call steady. If you've got one, you may as well hang on to it. Uh, you could always put it up for sale for a top price and see if you get it. It's probably a hang-on stay market. You're not going to be able to pay off your house with one. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to you know, the market's going to plummet overnight. So, you know, we're going to see it, I personally think, see it drop slowly over time. Like you say, 10 years, something like that. You know, it's it's not a bad, if you're into the cars, I mean, we've talked about it in other podcasts. When it boils down to it, sometimes it's about more about passion with most of us than it is about profit or, or money. There's a, an old saying that a lot of my friends tend to use, which is, you know, a lot of us are, are car rich and money poor because we just put everything we have into the cars that we love and, and, you know, have fun with. If you did want to jump into the early car market, there probably is no better car than really a Model T uh, to get into the early, early car market. They're easy to work on. They're simple to drive. You can do a lot with them. You can learn a lot about early cars on a Model T. I'll, I'll just, for the fun of it, I, I've got to disagree with John because 
in my opinion, the cars are very usable and can be a blast. Um, you know, you can tune a Model T correctly and, and do a few things to it. You can run 50, 55 mile an hour in a Model T Ford down the back roads. Yeah, you're not going to go on the, the expressway or the freeway. A great car and, and something that's actually very usable. I know guys that drive them really on a daily basis to and from work and, and just have fun with them. So, I mean, that would be my advice to anyone who was thinking about getting into um, the early car world would be start with something probably a Model T or really the second most popular car of that time, which was called an Overland, because they're both fairly easily accessible cars and parts are available for them. And you can learn from there and start working your way into that part of the collector car world. Who said a Model T was easy to drive? I did. (laughs) One of my, quote, claims to fame is I'm... 45 or 46 years old, like we say, I can't remember, or like I've said before, I can't remember how old I am. And I'm probably the youngest person on the planet who has crashed a Model T into a Model A and created damage because somebody forgot to tell me the little key with a Model T is if you need the dang thing to stop, push any two pedals. Yep. And, uh, (laughs) well, that didn't happen. And somehow I forgot, and in pulling it into the shop one night, uh, we, uh, had a slight collision with the Model A that was supposed to be delivered at 8 a.m. the next morning. So instead of going home, we still delivered that car the next morning. But needless to say, we were all in the shop very tired. (laughs) That's a story you shouldn't tell on yourself, John. (laughs) (laughs) I'm honest. That's all all I, I can say. I mean, you can't find anybody else that has done that. Yeah, true. There's also a reason I don't drive either one of the Model Ts we have at work. So <laughs> you've been barred. Is that what you're saying? One, I actually say Derek might have been the last person to operate one of the Model Ts we have at work. But I, I did years ago. I didn't get the opportunity to actually operate it. I helped you guys figure out some of the issues with it and get it fired up. But nobody wanted to let me drive it. I was a little disappointed. Might have been because you were so busy at the time. I don't know. I think the only T that I've ever driven had a uh, small block Chevrolet with uh, like eight carburetors on it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not a have, Model T. That, it doesn't. Count. <laughs> Did that have a fiberglass body on it? And no, sat two no, it was it was actually a, a steel body, you know, T bucket. It was a you know a Model T coupe with the roof cut off, but it was a it was a real. Model T. Now this car was built back in the '60s, um, so it, it had a lot of, you know, a lot of history of being a hot rod for a long time. But um, it only had, uh, it, you know, it had three pedals. That was it. Yeah, I guess in, that's, in saying that's what that Model too, T's I guess have three pedals. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> see, there you go. It's they just partly they original. Just, it had three pedals. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't do what you expect them to do. I, I was going to say we might need to clarify that three pedal statement I made earlier, but and we've done a great job of really confusing people. But I, I do believe they have proven that even in the modern three pedal setup, if you push any two pedals, the vehicle will stop. Yeah, you might you might sling a rod through the block. But... <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking <laughs> it, that it would stop. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, you know, we call that when you sling a rod through the brock, a yard sale. <laughs> I've always been told it's horrible when the internal engine compartments decide to explore the outside world. Yeah, we had one do that on a dyno about four weeks ago. I was thinking somebody recently showed me a picture and I was thinking that was that was a video I saw of one of your misfortunes, I guess. Yeah, go to scottydtv.com and type in 57 Chevrolet, Big Oak Garage. You'll see it. <laughs> Maybe we'll share that out on, if Scotty gives us permission, share that out on our page. See? Now Will's telling on himself, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but uh, I didn't blow it up. <laughs> And it, it wasn't the work that I did that blew it up either. So what what does that do to the um, collector value of that vehicle? <laughs> I do not believe that was a stock motor in that '57 Chevy that had the exploratory parts. We'll say. Oh no, far from stock. 
that that'll get into another show topic, I think. Cars with LS motors that shouldn't have LS motors. <laughs> but as, as we start progressing through the decades and we get up looking at what cars might become collectible, the next next big era, you, you have your 30s and 40s era automobiles, and they they seem to be popular right now, especially, I guess, what I see is in the lowrider crowd. Uh, a lot of the er- earlier cars are becoming resto mods because they're bigger, more usable. You can put a family in a, you know, a 40 Chevy or 39 Chevy or even a, a 48 Chevy. They get, you get to be used. There's still things you can drive, but Again, if you have me restore it, if you have Derek preserve it, or if you have Will rot it, and you are you are the person having the work done, you should be doing it out of a love of the vehicle and some sort of connection. Because if we try to put this in financials, it doesn't make sense to do. I kind of always have had a statement that if you can get 20, 30 cents on a dollar for a restoration that's done, you've won the game. There are cars, don't get me wrong, that you can break even on or maybe make a little bit of money. But for the majority of cars out there, I think I've alluded to figure 2,000 hours to do a frame off restoration, take the shop rate of wherever you're at, whether it be $45, whether it be $100, multiply that by $2,000. And then remember, you have to add parts onto that and the unforeseen things. At 50, 50 bucks an hour, you've got a hundred grand into the car. That's a good forty-eight Chevy. Might be thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've priced one. That's on a good day. I guess I, I'm referring a lot of my numbers to asking prices rather than selling prices. We, you know, we can always look at eBay and see what people are hoping for and always discount those numbers. Never never go to eBay to appraise your car. If you're a seller, yes. If you're a buyer, no, those aren't, those aren't the real numbers. Buyer beware in those situations. The flip side of those cars, the, the, the American cars, certain foreign cars, but the, really the foreign car market didn't move here until World War II. I mean, you have pre-war Mercedes and things like that, and those fit in their super collectible uh, high dollar ranges, and we're trying to keep this. I think more of the thinking in that I want to say house money cars, uh, where you can buy them for fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, as opposed to. I mean, we'd have a whole different topic if we were talking six million dollar, twenty twenty million dollar cars. And when you're getting into you start moving into the fifties, late forties, you have your MG TCs, TDs, a very popular sports car. They trade all day long for the teens and low 20s. They have as long as I can remember. Yeah, and uh, I think I think um, one of the things, at least, I've always thought in kind of this collecting realm, especially when you get into, say, the 40s, 50s, and even pushing into the early 60s a little bit, is I'm kind of waiting, and I, I think I'm starting to see it a little bit, and, and maybe others are too, but for a long time, everybody that collected cars really only aimed to get the, you know, the coupes, the two-door sedans, the, the you know, sportier, if that's a good word to use, it probably isn't, but the, the cooler cars, not the big four-door sedans and the station wagons. And those got kind of pushed to the side for a long time. And I think we're starting to see more appreciation for the four-door sedans, the the station wagons. I was driving home tonight from work, actually, and saw a young, young guy, probably in his mid-20s, cruising around in what appeared to be probably around a late 60s Vista Cruiser, you know, painted red. A nice-looking car, but, you know, the kid just, he had a big smile on his face, and he was out for a drive. You know, so I, I I think we're, at least I'm starting, and maybe you guys disagree, but, and maybe I hope, because I think it would be cool to see a bigger appreciation for those type of cars. I agree 100%. I mean, we were in Columbus at the Good Guys event, the Good Guys Nationals last weekend. I turned around and looked at Kyle, uh, guy that works for me, 
And I said, dude, look at all these station wagons. I mean, it seemed like every fifth car that drove by us was a station wagon. I mean, you know, station wagons are extremely hot right now. So, I, you know, I think that, you know, once something kind of gets that hot, they don't ever go away. They may cool off a little bit, but they never just go away. Um, when I was, when I was a kid, a 37 Ford, everybody thought was one of the ugliest cars ever made. And then, you know, the next four or five years, heck, everybody wanted a 37 Ford and they, they never cooled back off. You know, a 37 Ford is a, is a, a pretty well desirable car right now. And I, you know, it probably always will be. So, you know, I think wagons are, you know, they're, they're on their way up right now. I can agree with you too, Derek. It, it, it's kind of the follower phase, I guess. Once the two-door sedans and that all got bought up, the, it has a tendency to bring everything else up. Advent of the minivan made this generation of people that are building the street rods and that forget the station wagons and the stigma that goes with the station wagon. And those automatically now become really popular because they're actually lower production numbers. There's fewer of them than there were the two-door coupes. So it's much more rare to have a station wagon or find a good station wagon because they were also used as utility vehicles. They're kind of like the pickup truck, but not the same numbers. They were used. They were family cars. They were beat up. They were road trip. They had bunches of miles put on them. They towed trailers, all this stuff. They were abused and thrown away and forgotten. And now the, the station wagon market is definitely hot. You know, I think every car guy fantasizes about a, a shooting brake type car, which is a two-door station wagon. And Will Will's right. I have, you know, I stopped by to see him at the same Good Guys event, and there were a lot of wagons. Derek was late to the uh, pre-show, so Will and I were killing some time, and I was chatting with him, and I said, did you see this New Yorker? I was parked next to a Mercedes 190 SL. I was on air ride and lowered both of them. And it's a four-door sedan from the 50s. And I said, I got a, you know, there, there's a four-door uh, uh, sedan in my life. And what would you think? So not more than an hour ago was I, I was even talking about, hey, what could we do with making this four-door car cool? There's one thing that it's an extremely low mileage car. It could be collectible, but I've watched this car in the market for years. It's the low, you know, it was the very basic, say, Plymouth of the day. There and a lot of cars above it. There's a lot of market to move up before this one will accelerate. And I'm going, but I, I, I want to use the thing. How about we do one or two things to make it cool? So I guess I'm even guilty of that as all of a sudden, the four doors kind of cool. And then if we look at what's selling today on the market, there's very few two doors on the market. There are a few two door ca cars. I mean, BMW has some, Audi has some, but four doors outsell everything. And there's a convenience factor. It's easy to load the kids into. It's easy to put a car seat in the back. It's easy to take two couples out. And if, you know, you have a car, you can take your buddy and his wife and your wife and go to dinner in the cool car and not have to climb over seats and that. So I'll agree with you that we, we're going to see, I think the the four doors of that 50s and 60s are going to become hot cars. You know, we can say that you know, nothing ever from the 70s is going to be that way. But right now the little two doors are getting bought up and used and the, the Vista Cruisers and the Grand Marquis wagons and Things like that are on the rise, and soon we're going to start seeing the the New Yorkers and the LTDs and stuff start following that too. So I think you're you're very accurate, and if if you wanted to get into something cheap and you know have something different and cool, whether it be stock or whether it's slightly massaged or whether you put a million bucks into it and and go wild, I would say that or that is a a, a market section you might want to look into. We bought a uh, a mid '60s GM wagon back. I don't know, about, I guess about this time last year, and um, it was kind of a barn find survivor type type of car. Didn't pay a whole lot for it. Brought it in, rebuilt the motor, got it running, driving, rebuilt the brakes, stuck it on eBay, and made some really good money. 
didn't do any paint work didn't do any interior work because all that was actually really pretty nice um so there you go i mean we uh sunk a little bit of money into it and it was very well worth the the return like you say they're getting very popular kind of hot in the market um about i'd say probably six or eight years ago my uncle out in california has had uh 1958 del rey sedan delivery for nice decades you know he's got a just a 350 you know chevy small block in it he was a mechanic for a long time this this runs in the family as we've talked about but never been a body man so he actually sent it out to my dad uh, in his shop in michigan did the the body restoration on it you know a little bit of a custom paint job kind of a copper tone you know a new the newer era metallic copper tone color with some highlights here and there you know nice interior the cool thing about it is it's one of the few Delray sedan deliveries that actually had a folding rear seat in it so there's actually room for more people than just the front seat uh, which is kind of cool I mean, he got the thing. I mean, he flew out to Michigan, picked it up when it was done, drove it all the way back to California. It has been everywhere he takes it. It is loved by everyone. You know, he just has a blast with the car, meeting people that just want to know about it because it's not just another, you know, coupe or two-door sedan. It's it's a weird, unique station wagon, you know, sedan delivery, but it's it's just cool and people love to see it. Again, it's that unique fact kind of draw, you know draws people. People love it because they've never seen it or they remember it. Again, when you go to why we do this, I think the majority of people are in cars or when they get back into cars or they go out to buy a collectible car or a fun car, a lot of it is what they remember from their childhood. And while I might venture to say it'll never be collectible. Every now and then I'll do an eBay search for a 77 Dodge Aspen station wagon because we grew, I grew up with one. Uh, we bought it right after or right before my brother was born. We lived five hours or something from people and there, there were many road trips where, you know, it was before seat belts or anything. It had the seats in the back. These, I can't, well, maybe this one did it. My grandfather's station wagons did. But I remember getting a lot of Fisher-Price toys for Christmas and setting those up in the back. I remember watching TV on a nine-inch black and white that was 12-volt power in the back of the car. And there's those little bits of youth while... It's a 77 Dodge Aspen or a Slant 6. I remember a rusted out fender. I remember the radio antenna getting hit by a bird on an exit ramp. Those little memories, it would be cool to have one. I was at the uh, Wellborn Museum a few, well, about a year ago for one of their events, and somebody was there with a 76 Aspen in powder blue, and they had put a 360 in it, so it was kind of cool, and it brought back that memory, but... Like I said, why that's probably never going to be an A car, We those are things we remember. We remember those as kids. Will has alluded in many episodes about traveling the country in a 56 Chevrolet, riding in the back of it. And I know people re have talked about, in general conversations, they remember getting up on the package shelf of whatever huge car they grew up in and riding cross country or taking a nap on it. Things are completely unheard of today when it comes to automobiles, but things that cause those little bit it's a memory. And a lot of times we're trying to chase that memory or that youth. And that could be some of the draw of the station wagon. My Go memory ahead. of station wagon is, and I don't know if you guys have, you know, ridden in these or, you know, I'm guessing you both probably have, but the, I, I can't even remember what what station wagon it was let's you know chevy it was it was probably a chevy because my dad was a gm guy but had the rear facing seat at the back and that's probably my one of my fondest memories from childhood is sitting in that rear facing seat all the way in the back and looking out the back window of the station wagon watching the road you know going backwards and you know that's that's my memory of station wagon and, and it's a cool memory I dig it, and I think it'd be cool to own one of those, you know, 
again, like John said, you know, kind of capturing that youth again. And being able to put the kids in the back of it facing backwards and causing everybody in their Volvo SUVs to, ah, what's going on? What's happening here? Pretty. And that what I want to say that was General Motors because my grandfather had a 77 Ford something with pop-up head, well, enclosed headlamps. And the seats opened side by side, and you faced each other, and you put four in the very back. Yeah. And he yeah. replaced that with he replaced that with a General Motors product, and then we had the seat that faced out the rear window when we would ride with him. You know, we would go up and visit him, and him and my grandmother, and then my parents in the back seat, and me and my brother all the way in the back. You know, looking at everybody else and probably making faces and. Whatever we did in the back seats of those. Yeah, pretty much all of your GM station wagons, you could get a nine-passenger option, which was that uh, fold-down seat in the back, and it opened up, you know, backwards. So you looked out the, uh, you looked out the back glass. We've had, I don't know, several nine-passenger GM wagons that they all, they all have that. I think even the Tri Five Chevys had a nine-passenger option that had the fold-down seat in the back. I think that that's probably, again, it's going back to that's a driving factor. It's things that people remember of their cars. And now we kind of progress into the 80s. And I've already jumped there once with the advent of the minivan. And again, things that stick with me. I'm a huge mid-80s Chrysler front-wheel drive fan. We had one of the first caravans that came to market. A 84 Dodge Caravan, five-passenger maroon, very basic. That was revolutionary, and it wasn't a station wagon, so you were cool with it. And now here we are, 2017, and it's not cool to have a minivan. I I went to good guys in a Honda Odyssey. Station wagons are cool again. It's the generations and what we forget. Who knows what's going to be collectible from the 80s? That's the market right now that I think the money's beginning to come into. That's where, excuse me, I'm in my 40s. We're just beginning to make our money and being able to go back and buy those youthful cars. And that's why I think your late 80s Porsches are are a little bit hotter. Your BMW M3s, the first generation, I don't do chassis numbers, is I think the M30 BMW M3. Excuse me if I'm wrong, please correct me. Those are extremely hot because those are the cars we saw in the magazines and they're kind of the bottom feeder collectible cars without getting into the the really you know fancy porsches or the mercedes-benz hammer amg hammers things like that that market's i'm seeing a little bit of movement in that market and then the japanese market from the late 80s there's more and more social media groups popping up around the CRXs or the MR2s or the Corolla SR5s, the Toyota Celicas, the earlier ones, this you know, the Toyota Supra from the mid '90s has always been a hot car, has always been been a deal, and always been at that topper, or excuse me, top collector car. But the stuff from the '80s is just beginning to come into its own, and the Camaro IROX, the Z28s, the Fox, nothing's hotter, it seems, than a Fox body Mustang right now. It was a deal in 1988 to go out and buy a five liter Mustang for $13,000, $14,000. They were great. They were, they're again, cars from our youth, and that's, that's what drives the market. And I think if you really want to get into something, those are the cars to really be looking at right now. The stuff from the 90s is still a depreciable asset. The stuff from the 2000s, I have a hard time sitting here thinking that, oh, man, you know, it's a 20-year-old car from 2000. Yeah, and I think I think so, one of the things we, we talked about, and we didn't really hit it too much, I don't think, in our truck uh, discussion, but right now the, you know, 70s and 80s trucks, your, your square-bodied Chevys, those are are hot. At least uh, I know in maybe the north and and some of that area, era of truck is quite popular for guys to be buying up and collecting. And I think it it's the same thing with some of the other cars John's talked about. Is that is the truck of their youth? You know, they're bringing it back and reviving it and reliving those memories in it. But it's becoming a hot market. I mean, the the aftermarket supply world for it, the restoration parts world for it is becoming huge um, with new body panels and, and all the things you need to restore one of those trucks is 
is becoming huge, I think we're going to see a lot of collecting of those as well. Yeah, I, I watched that market pretty close. I've probably had 30 of those trucks. And a uh, matter of fact, I still got a uh, two-wheel drive 83 model K5 Blazer that uh, my dad actually bought for me when I was in high school. So I, I still own uh, my very first vehicle, which just happened to be a square body Blazer two-wheel drive, which is a pretty rare option on one of those. Um, so I watched that market pretty close, and I, I have three of them right now. And, um, man, they, they're increasing every day. Uh, the aftermarket industry for, I mean, there's people building chassis, complete chassis for them trucks already um, with, with, and not bad priced either. I mean, you, you can get uh, pretty much whatever you want to make it perform like a race car or just go down the road and scrape the rockers, you know, wheel and tire choice, brake options, anything you can think of is out there for those, um, uh, what was it, uh, 73 through 87 Chevrolet trucks. Uh, huge, huge market for those right now. Yeah, I remember those. I'm, I, I've even had the, uh, the, the C10 in 1981, and I did, did convertible and bed swap and lowered it, and that was late 80s project for me, early 90s. It was kind of a cool truck then, but I couldn't afford a 60s era truck, and so that's what I ended up buying. And then as, you know, now we get to, again, well, I'm going to go back to the 60s era C10s and that are ex expensive. I mean, there's deals to be had, but there's a lot of work. You can still buy a C10 in the square body, reasonable and have a decent car. And then you can do some work to it. And as Derek has alluded, the parts are there. They built millions of these things and there's not that many differences. The aftermarket has always been there for it. So it hasn't been too expensive for the aftermarket to stay there. They're Chevrolets. Uh, it's coil over suspension, unlike the Ford with the I-beams, where if you bend an I-beam, it gets to be a major thing. The Chevrolets are easy to work on. They're easy to easy to modify. They're easy to make run. It's a 350 motor, or it's an engine bay that you can put anything in that you want to. I've alluded that I've, I've got an, another friend in northern Alabama uh, owns a sh small shop. He just started it a year or two ago called Gage Customs. And it seems, or his Facebook feed is filled all the time. He's usually got one of those in as a project truck and he puts it up for sale and I go, oh, I need to drive up and see it. It's sold in a day or it's sold in two days at numbers that I can't believe these things are selling for. They just, that is probably the hottest truck on the market right now. I bet you it would rival the brand new Ford F-150 for the number that are sold per year. <laughs> You're <laughs> probably right. You're probably right. It's it's that truck thing. We covered it in the truck episode. We won't get into it too deep here because we're planning to do a Trucks 2 episode. It's going on. And when I was walking around Good Guys, I'm going, man, I kind of want something like this again. I wonder if I could do a square body Chevy. And I'm going, I probably don't want to pay for a square body Chevy to do the work to. Maybe I need to start looking at the 88, 89s when they went to the round bodies. That's exactly it. The square bodies are becoming too expensive to do projects to. You want to buy a truck, buy a good 88 Chevy or an 89 Chevy C1500 and sit on it. Somebody's going to come pay you a bunch of money for that in 10 years because the C10s are going to become the way the 60s era C10s are. They're going to become expensive trucks. And, and do you know what? The aftermarket's right there for those trucks, too, because they've been customizing them for years. I remember my truck and magazine from 1988 where Boyd Coddington did the first chop top on one of those. It's... You know, it sits there. It's still still in my mind. It, it's there. I think the square bodies look better than the round bodies, but my wallet agrees more with the round bodies than the square bodies. And why it comes down to passion, 50% of it is money, too. I'm not, not a multimillionaire, so I just can't go out and do that. I, ha I have to be a little bit careful with where I, I spend my money. Something I would like to add, since we're talking about value of cars and stuff, is if you find a car out there just because it's rare and it's low mileage and they didn't make a lot of them and, and you think that it's going to bring a lot of money, that don't necessarily mean it's going to bring a lot of money. I have this conversation uh, a good bit in the shop. People come in and they start telling me about how rare this car is. And, and you know, sometimes I have to explain to them it, it was the reason it is rare is because they didn't make any of them because nobody wanted them then and nobody wants them now. 
Uh, so you kind of got to be careful with, with some of that, the rarity of, of some of these cars. Cause you know, a lot of people, they, they still don't want them. So just because it's rare, don't make it valuable. What's wrong with that is a very though. good point. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you priced Yugos lately? No, a no, good Yugo will bring, <laughs> a, a good Yugo will bring sticker price. Thirty nine ninety five, <laughs> no decimal <laughs> except at the end. A couple of years ago, I was online, and it, it's that crazy thing is popped up on eBay. Seventeen hundred miles, nineteen seventy six Chevrolet Chevette Woody. They built five hundred of them. I got out of the bidding at about sixty two hundred dollars. The car ended up selling for sixty seven. I thought it would be four grand, and that's kind of where I what I wanted to pay because it was kind of cool. But five hundred Chevette. Woody's, is that really a collectible car? Is that something that's going to roll through Barrett-Jackson on a Saturday? It's a Thursday Barrett-Jackson car. I'm sorry, all day long. Yep. Will, right. I, I've got friends that talk about, oh, my car's one of 13. My car's one of, I've got documentation from Pontiac or Chrysler, or, because they, they all will do that for you now. And actually, I've got a Hemmings article from this week somewhere talking about how all manufacturers now have to provide these build, she build sheets and there's no cutoff dates or anything and they're not sure how this law is going to take. You can go back and pull out your build sheet. Your your Nova, Derek, or not your Nova, your uh, GTO that you had. How many were built with every option but power brakes? There was a reason they there, yours was probably one of four <laughs> because nobody wanted that car without power brakes. And you know what? Today, nobody wants that car without power brakes. I want it back. Uh, <laughs> okay. There's one person. <laughs> if you have a 74 Nova. No, no, no. Pontiac, power no, brakes. No, no, no. Not a Nova. Pontiac no, I, I'm GTO. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it looks like okay, a Nova. If you have a... But not a Nova. A 70, 74 GTO with every option but power brakes. Shoot us an email at no driving gloves, and we'll get you in touch with Derek. Does anybody still own a 74 GTO? GTO we collectors. Had a conversation about, <laughs> we had a conversation about junkyards last week. <laughs> <laughs> Those big heavy cars are gone. Uh, most of them have probably been rebadged Novas because they're probably worth more. Yeah. Nova and SS, and that's all you need. Uh, and that's something else I'd like to add, too, is, you know, generally speaking in, in the hot rod industry, something 72 and older is generally worth a good bit more than something that's 73 and newer just because of the cutoff of a lot of these hot rod shows is 72. Well, there's, you know, rumor floating around that, uh, NSRA has already opened up to their, they have a running 30 year deal. So if your car is 30 years old, it can go to an NSRA event, which is, you know, help the market some. But if, if all of these, you know, big car show, uh, organizations would, would open it up to say a 30 year rolling or, a you know, to 87 or something like that, then, you know, that's ultimately going to be driving the market up too. So that's something to pay attention to is if, if these, you know, hot rod, street rod type shows start opening up to, uh, you know, newer year models, that's, that's going to drive the market up for, you know, the IROC Camaros, the, the Fox body Mustangs, which are already pretty hot. Uh, so any, any of those cars are going to start becoming more more desirable and more valuable and you know the the little you know 79 80 malibus little two doors and wagons you know those are going to start increasing in value as well your your point's very well taken in dealing with vintage race cars which i think is one of the hottest portions of the market it's not necessarily as affordable because not only do you buy the car you then have to be able to afford to race it but for a, a race car to really have value, you have to be able to do something with it. For example, a year or two ago, one of the Caterham Formula One cars was being floated for sale. It was actually owned locally, and then it went to Atlanta, ended up in Atlanta. And the guy was trying to shop this thing for 100, 150 grand without a motor because it was a Formula One car. The thing is, there's nothing in the world you can do with this unless you might get an invite, or excuse me, an invite to Goodwood. If you get invited to Goodwood, they might let you run it up the hill if you can figure out how to put a motor 
in this chassis that was custom designed for a Renault power plant that you cannot get your hands on and a transaxle that you cannot get your hands on. And the guy's trying to shop the thing for a hundred grand, hundred grand, hundred and fifty grand. It might be worth ten grand because it's an exhibition piece. There's nothing you can do with it. Uh, NASCAR stock cars were that way for the longest time. There was nothing you could really do with it. an old NASCAR car. There was no vintage race class. It's still hard to find some vintage race classes other than some road courses. And then you want a road course Dale Earnhardt car. Or you want a road course Tim Richmond car or something. But the circle track cars, they're museum exhibits because they can only be used in a museum. One of the things... I talk about when I do uh, lectures on vintage racing and the importance of vintage racing is people can't stand the fact or the thought that you're taking your $17 million Ferrari out on track in Monterey because you might wreck it. Well, do you know what? That car was a race car in 1958 when it was new and it was wrecked. And it was a race car in 1963 when it was a couple of years old and it was wrecked. And a couple of years later, it probably had a Chevrolet small block in it because the Ferrari parts were impossible to find in a Ford. And it was on its sixth owner who had been buying it because it was last year's race car, last year's race car. And there's nothing more worthless than last year's race car. And it ran with a Chevy. There's a good series of books, Bowtie, Bowtie Ferraris and Blue Oval Ferraris. There's two books that this gentleman wrote. And they were about these Ferraris that had Ford and Chevrolet motors in them. And none of the Ford and Chevrolet or none of the guys that own those Ferraris now will admit to it. They even had a category or a class approved for Pebble Beach, but nobody would enter it because these people didn't want their Ferraris tainted with being shown because they used to have Chevrolet motors in them. But they, there was nothing for them to do. They became worthless cars. We hear the stories. Well, I could have bought a Ferrari for $2,000 in 1967. That's because it was last year's race car. It was worthless. And then when vintage racing and historic racing came about, it gave them places to go. They gave, it gave the owners something to do with them. And the value started to go up. And that's why these Ferraris are worth $12 million and $15 million now. Or... Uh, I think Adam Carolla recently sold one of his Paul Newman. No, it wasn't. It was a Fitzgerald 280Z on Bring a Trailer for $150,000. Of course, Fitzgerald brings some money to to the table and it being his car and he won races in it. But there's a there's places you can go use that car. If there wasn't a place you could go use that car, it wouldn't be worth nearly as much money because... It's a museum display. You're not going to convert it back to a road car. Why would you, you know, you buy it for road car money at that point. You're, it's it's a race car and it needs a place to go. And much like you're talking with the street rod shows, 72 or older, there's more money there because it's it's eligible for these shows. It's eligible, eligible for these competitions. Race cars, vintage racing is the hottest thing on the market right now next to a Concours. Everybody wants a Concours. And if they can't have a Concours and they have a racetrack, they want a historic automobile race. And they're, they're, they pop up like crazy. But what it's doing is it's allowing these race cars to have new life. Even the Lemon Series and the Chump Car Series, they are bringing some life back to $500 cars. There's a lot more, you know, if you're doing lemons, it's a car you've got to pay, for, you know, you've got to have less than $500 invested in, less all the safety equipment and everything. You know, the entry fee costs you more than $500. Don't think you can race for $500 in lemons. Let me destroy that myth right there. But it's all of a sudden brought some value to some Craigslist cars that, guess what? They, <laughs> they're worthless $200 cars until I can buy it and run it in lemons, and now all of a sudden it's a $300 or $400 car. There's a whole board out there about lemons cars for sale, and it's just junk cars that now all of a sudden have some worth because they can be competitive in this race series. So anything that a car can be used for, whether it be racing or showing or exhibition, I think, Derek, is it the CCA that you've got to be 1949 or older or 1959 or older uh, the, to have a car? Yeah, the CCCA, the oh. Classic Car Club of America. Um, and there's 
there's rules in inside of it um, as to what cars are allowed in to the club, you know, down to a point of actual make and model. Uh, you know, most Marmons are allowed in, certain Marmons aren't. And, and there's uh, you can go down the list of that. And yeah, I mean, there are clubs that are extremely picky like that. And I will touch on and and say, you know, you were talking about the the lemons. We just had the one of the events for the lemons race at the motorsports park uh, here at the NCM Motorsports Park, and I went over and checked it out. I had a friend actually driving in it. You know, like you say, you see cars that are two hundred, three hundred dollar cars on eBay, and I mean, you see the goofiest things. There was a yeah, there was a gremlin over there covered with hair. You know, there was a hairy gremlin. Um, <laughs> you know, there's the, the actually. Oh, did that? What did that actually been Gizmo before he got wet? Yes, yes, it was. We thankfully it did not rain that weekend, but we also had an. And I noticed, I think it was a Hemmings article or something on it. Uh, the the sideways microbus, the VW that's built to lay the microbus built to lay on its side and be driven around, uh, was over at the track. I saw it in one of the garages, you know. And it, it's just these goofy cars that people buy and do crazy things with. You know, attach different paraphernalia to um, <laughs> to make the cars unique I, and I, interesting I, looking. We we also hold a lemons race uh, in February, and the the museum we we've run a car the last two years, which is an old two hundred SX that's dressed up to look like the um, Easy Rider chopper, red, white, and blue, huge ape hanger handlebars, headlight on it, the big sissy bar seat. So it's a way to have fun. But again, we found the car on. Uh, found it on Craigslist, and ironically, it is a factory Datsun 200SX race car that was sold to a local SCCA racer or given to a local SCCA racer who was sponsored by Datsun. It was a race car in its day. There's no way in the world this car would have ever been an, a race car ever again without the Lemon Series, and now now it holds some some value, and you know there's a little bit of money into it, and. It's, again, driven junkyards for economy. It's added, you know, this guy was able to sell this car. I believe it actually was in, it's made it as far south as New Orleans and was in Katrina. It was a flood damage car at some point in its life. Or I don't know how, how that happens when it has no engine or transmission or whatever. But it's it's that cool thing that Lemons has provided is all of a sudden, like like you said, it, it's a way to have fun with your cars, and it's a way to do it for little or no money, and has made some cars fairly popular. There's certain cars that are good in the Lemon series, if especially if you know how to interpret the rules. So I guess we've actually covered going all the way through from starting with horseless carriage, I think that was the first word out of Derek's mouth, all the way to Lemons Racing at NCM Motorsports Park, what, three or four weeks ago. So uh, actually uh, a week, week ago. ago, week ago. OK, so in six, uh, I'm going to say 60 minutes. I don't know how long this is once I go back and edit. But in an hour, we've covered 140 years of collectible. That's hard to do. I don't know if we actually said anything, but we had a good time talking about it. Does anybody want to add anything? I think we talked a lot over you, Will. I, I'm trying to think you you were talking and I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit. Some of the hottest cars on the market right now are the Volkswagens. Yeah. And you know, Der Derek's talking about the article in Hemmings about the microbus that's flipped on its side. That's actually a microbus. I've, I've read the article, sat on a rabbit pickup. And I've read the comments that how dare they destroy a microbus? Well, this is the worthless or the, the microbus that's worthless right now, but because the bottom feeders always follow along. Eventually it'll be worth something, but it sat on a rabbit pickup truck. And there's a lot of rabbit pickup truck people upset that they destroyed a rabbit pickup truck for this also. <laughs> so it's, I don't know what to say. It just encompasses everything. And it's, you know, who would have thought, you know, Volkswagen Beetles would be selling for a hundred thousand dollars. 
Who would have thought that I would have saw two of them at Good Guys this weekend? One of them, I don't even know what the one inside the building had in it. It had, um, Scotty D has. <laughs> where are we are plugging Scotty D like crazy? <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have, to have him on the show. We'll have to have him on the show so that <laughs> he pays us back for this publicity. That uh, but he, that one had a uh, a Buick nailhead in it. It's called the Berlin Buick. Yep. Yep, I, I remember seeing that was a nail head, but it had a little for, force uh, slits out of each quarter yep. panel where the exhaust exited out of the side like it was a P51 extremely, Mustang. Extremely, extremely cool Volkswagen. Probably the coolest uh, Beetle I've ever seen before in my life. An in, in, insane amount of work. Um, now, I'm not a street rider. I don't judge at those shows, and I have no qualifications, but that might have been the co- one of the coolest cars there. There was a little Datsun bullet side pickup truck I saw walking in that had the step side bed, like much like my Ford yeah, Courier was, used to have. That was a cool truck. And, and I like that one, too. But, you know, the, the three cars that I like, well, there were four cars out there that really stood out, and no offense, Will, it was that Volkswagen, it was the 190 SL on Air Ride, it was that Datsun bullet side pickup, and there was a stock Mini Cooper right behind the row that you were parked, or had uh, the Bryce Thomas radiator yep, display yep, right behind and them. Yep, there, there was a stock Mini Cooper in, in that. And I'm going, here I am at a street ride show, and... The typical sports car me, uh, mini trucker me, I'm attracted to the foreign vehicles here. So <laughs> obviously I'd never be a judge there because the Volkswagen would have got my vote in, in, well, inside to, the building to, there. to me, the Volkswagen won the show. I mean, it it it, it did win a, a, a pretty big award at the event. Um, but in, in my opinion, that was the uh, definitely the people's choice uh overall winner of good guys columbus this year was at the berlin buick uh beetle definitely there there's always politics to those shows and maybe one day we'll have the guts to talk about it because i go to shows and get judged you go to shows and get judged and i have a feeling if Derek doesn't know it he's going to go to shows and get judged and (laughs) why we want to have a no driving gloves attitude we we do have to (laughs) <laughs> kind of protect protect our day job. Well, I, get, and, and I get judged everywhere I go. <laughs> you know, you're right about politics, but the the award that they put that uh, Volkswagen in into, um, you know, it really didn't fit the criteria. So, I mean, I, I knew that the car wouldn't be a top five finalist or win just because of the criteria of that specific award that they were going after if he would have parked it anywhere else, it wouldn't have got the attention that that car deserved to get. So I was proud to see him pull it in there. I don't, I don't know who built it. I don't know who owns it, but when I saw it out there on the autocross, I was just like, dude, that's freaking awesome right there. You know, just they, 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 they took it out there and I guarantee you there was more pictures of that car took than the rest of the whole field combined. So they won. Yeah, see that that car, and we'll definitely share S- Scotty's video about it. He goes into it a little bit more, so, so that everybody can see it. To me, it was the epitome of a a car at a car show, a custom car. It m- didn't follow any other established pattern there. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, Johnson's Rod Shop had a, a VW convertible, a flat windshield VW convertible in their booth. So there were two Beetles there. For somebody to do that and to put that money into it in that time and for it to be in one of the top 12 street machines in that street machine category that it was in for judging inside the building, I, I commend the builder and, and the owner. The problem, I don't know if they're the same or not, to be able to have that insight, be willing to do it. And there's no no doubt in my mind the only reason they did it is to be different and have fun. And that 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 car was the epitome of fun. Don't get me wrong; the other cars that were there were cool. I mean, there there were some over the top things, but that that one stands out into my head because, like I said, I'm a foreign car sports car person. Well, so all, the rest of the cars in that whole category that were in that building, they all blended together. They all had the same styling. Well, the, there was a Corvette in there that was was done a little bit different, but you know they were all along that same pro touring line um and it was different it stood out and you know it takes balls to do something like that and that, that to me that's you're right john that that's 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 why you should build a car because you like it it don't matter what everybody else thinks 
build something that you like that that you can in, enjoy and drive and, and be seen in. Yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, I think it's you know, John said it's it's about the fun, and yeah, you know, we can talk like we have this episode about yeah you know, where the collector kind of craze is going, where the the money is going in the collector car world, but in the end, you know make sure you have fun with it. Like That's right. don't just, don't just get wrapped up in the, I want to make money. So I'm going to buy this car to invest in, and, you know, stock, lock it away. And in 50 years, I'm going to pull it out and I'm going to have made a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I mean, I guess if you want to do that, do that, but man, get into it for fun. That's, that's the big thing. Never get in, never, never get into cars for money. <laughs> you, you, you get into them because you enjoy them. If you want to make money, there's always real estate. They're not making more. The real estate that's on the planet is all the real estate we have now until we colonize Mars and the moon. So we're not making any more real estate. They are making a million, two million, three million new cars a day. So, you know, you do it because you enjoy it. If you happen to make money, consider yourself lucky. And I think that's where we should probably end this. We've gone a little bit long. Do it for fun. Don't do it for money. If you make money, consider, like I said, consider yourself lucky. I think from the three of us here at No Driving Gloves, we thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Be sure to check us out on NoDrivingGloves.com where you can find email contacts and get, provide us a show topic idea or even provide some feedback. Also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter or Instagram, and be sure to check out our Patreon page where the levels there are the only way to get stickers, t-shirts, and even one-on-one -on -one consultations with the guys. Most of all, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts as it does help keep the wheels rolling.